Hello, and this is Mike. I'm one of the hosts of the Abundant Aging Podcast. And this is Beth. I'm the other host for the podcast. And I think this is the first time, Mike, that you and I have appeared together on the podcast. But it's certainly not the last time, Beth. And we're looking forward to some upcoming shows where you and I can really unpack kind of the foundational tropes of ageism. And uh, I think hopefully use that as a great foundation leading into our symposium in October, right? Absolutely. It'll be October 4th, 2024 this year. And uh, more information and teasing about that um, in the upcoming weeks. In the meantime, we're taking a little bit of a summer um, break here. And I'm going to invite you to revisit some of the um, fantastic conversations that we've had over the course of the past year or so. That's right. So uh, absolutely make sure to stay tuned and listen to more of great content that you've already enjoyed. And please send us your ideas for future guests, future episodes, whatever you need to share or whatever you'd like to share at AbundantAgingPodcast.com. Looking forward to um, hearing from you and to providing new episodes coming a little bit later this summer. Thanks all for participating and, and listening and, and um, being with us here on the Abundant Aging Podcast. Thanks for listening all. We'll look forward to seeing you guys back in the fall. Elizabeth has risen to recent fame through her role as an author and an advocate in the aging space. Her book, 55, Underemployed and Faking Normal, documents her struggle and the struggle of many that are over the age of 50 to find meaningful, sustained employment, and it launched her advocacy for ending ageism and being a champion for older workers. We can now add the word entrepreneur to her accomplishments with her launch of New Age Co-Living, a developing concept in community living that aims to serve the middle, mar middle market, middle income market in a way that supports abundant living and aging. So definitely a kin kindred spirit to what we're doing here at United Church Homes. Elizabeth holds advanced degrees from Harvard and John Hopkins and has a distinguished employee history that, of course, includes her work today. Welcome, Elizabeth. No, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So I let's start start where it matters most. Let's start where where does your passion for this topic come from? Um, which I, I did a high level um, overview, but from your words and helping to share your passion, can you share the part of the story that you'd like our listeners to to know about today that's launched your work? So it comes from my own lived experience. I'm someone who for many years was doing really well. And then during the Great Recession of 2008-9, stepped on a banana peel and uh, lost two big consulting jobs that I'd had for a long time. I was sort of mid fifties then. Uh, I have the credentials that you described, not worried, always been able to find work. And suddenly, middle 50s, my phone was not ringing. And uh, women talk. I had uh, one of my friends is an award-winning, Emmy award-winning producer. She wasn't finding work. Somebody who had been very, very senior in the government was not finding work. And at a point of really despair, I wrote an essay describing what is it like to land here when you are, you feel sort of, uh, face pressed up against the glass, looking in at a life that used to be yours, but now you can't afford that life and wondering if you will ever get back. And that essay made its way to the PBS Facebook page and in a matter of days had thousands and thousands of responses. It went viral. And it was a lot of me too, that this is my husband or my sister or myself. And why aren't we having a conversation about this? And my uh, educational background uh, allows me to look at the data. And what I thought was just a challenge that I was facing and a few friends, I began to understand that uh, millions of middle-class Americans are also struggling. Uh, so these would be people who uh, earn too much to get any government assistance, but don't make enough, for example, to uh, afford market rate housing uh, for older adults. 
And that sort of started me on a path. Yeah. So I, I think that that's probably the link then from you're talking about your book and your advocacy um, uh, about ageism in the workplace to, to housing. So um, talk a little bit more about, about where you've ended up from employment to, to, to housing? Um. So the journey was I uh, did this essay. And what happens when you uh, do an essay that goes viral is that people find your email address. So in the comments, they'd maybe write three, four sentences. But in their emails to me, it would be a page and a half single space of what had happened. And then what happens, somebody will say, I live in DC. They'll say, I'm gonna be in Washington. Uh, can you have a coffee? And I got more and more involved in hearing stories. And that's how my first self-published book was born. Sort of, I had seen a lot of books that were uh, sort of, you know, kind of think tank, Brookings Institute wrote about the retirement income crisis and it was geared towards uh, you know legislators, but there was nothing that if you personally landed here, if you were facing this, if this happened to you, there was not that book and all that you feel a uh, sense of failure and fear, nobody had written that book. So I, as I spoke with people started to have not just my story, but the stories of many others, men and women and men in particular, I wanted them to tell their own story because when men land here, uh, particularly for white men, ageism is often the first time they've experienced any kind of ism where up on site, people have a negative opinion of you. And so I asked um, men that I was encountering in my book to actually write the stories in their own words and then I edited it for length. So that then led to a book deal with Simon and Schuster, because one of the things when you self-publish, it's harder to get into libraries. Many libraries don't take self-published books. And for my audience, people needed to be able to get the book in the library. And then there were some independent bookstores that don't take self-published book and on it went. So when Simon & Schuster uh, gave me an opportunity to update the data and relaunch it, it gave it a bigger uh, audience. And also in that time, I um, did a TEDx talk that, that the TED people approached me about taking the TEDx talk and moving it to the main TED stage, which then it blew up in numbers. It's got now over 2 million views. So all these things were happening simultaneously. I am someone, I throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall. You don't know what's going to land. And I'm also someone who has friends across the age spectrum from early 30s to into their 90s. My younger friends, in some ways, are more plugged in in terms of who are the rising stars, what are the trends, where are the work opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities, et cetera. And uh, a, a friend and colleague, um, many years younger, decades younger, said to me, there is this startup studio that they will fund ideas and they will significantly support these ideas. You should apply. So, of course, I'm 68 at the time. I had been an entrepreneur before and I know exactly the heavy lift that is. And then I thought, I'm going to try it. So it had four rounds of interviews. And when I was told that I had made it from the second to the third round, and that now I'm a serious contender, I thought, let me pull my socks up here and really focus on this. And so uh, two years ago, I was told that I was accepted. So there were five of us where this is Ideas 42, and they invested uh, about 800000 to a million dollars per person in your idea. And I was the oldest by far. I felt a little bit like Grandma Moses in there. Everybody was, you know, half my age about. And so it was an opportunity to look at, I had been sounding the alarm and advocating. What 
would I do if I wanted to work on the solution side? And what I was hearing as I went around the country talking to people was about housing, because housing is often our biggest expense. It is sort of foundational in terms of our health and well being. And though many people want to age at home, many of our homes are not suited, you know, from a have steps or they're uh, don't have a bathroom on the main floor or they're just not affordable or something's happened to the neighborhood. So a lot of people who want to age at home, it's something like only 4% of the U.S. housing stock is actually suitable uh, for doing that. So I thought, let me think about housing. And I was also thinking about the number of people who are aging alone and meaning possibly never married, divorced, uh, maybe uh, widowed, or maybe they even have children, but their children are not in a position to help them. You know, I think about when I was uh, growing up and my grandfather died, I was a little girl, my grandmother came to live with my family. For 25 years, she lived with us. Nowadays, many families, there's no place to put Nana. There's no money to support Nana and also, you know, the rest of the family. So you have a lot of people who maybe do have children, but they're still in many ways aging alone. So that got me thinking about the housing situation, the aging alone, the affordability, the loneliness epidemic that we're facing. And is there a way to kind of hit on and address all of those? Um, thinking about individuals who um, find themselves um, alone and um, are, I, I think, I think I know where you're going a little bit with this, but um, aging is not a solo sport and we need to have um you know, to using the sports metaphor, we need to have teams of people around us in varying levels of proximity and relationships. So what I hear you talking about is kind of combining that with this foundational, literally and figuratively need for housing. So so where are you in 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 the journey then in 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 um Finding solutions because that, that's what that's what you're working on. So what the Ideas Forty Two Venture Studio did then is suddenly I had resources to hire experts. I could hire architects. I could hire people who knew real estate. I could hire people who knew shared housing. I could go to Amsterdam to the co living conference where they uh, the Europeans are really big on this, and to start to understand and think about best practice. We do do co-living in the U.S., but often it's for millennials. And um, in Europe, I found there was much more of a community aspect. Here, it's almost like the co-living is a perch, and then the younger person really lives in the neighborhood, but they it, it's almost like an extension of dorm living from college. And I wanted to see if I could do something more, if I could uh, rather than have sort of dorm rooms around a shared living space, could we actually have private quarters, smaller ones, but around a shared living space? So that in your private quarters, you do have a sitting area, sleeping area, you have an ensuite bathroom, there's like a kitchenette. So if you wanted to do a grilled cheese and some tomato soup, you could do that in there if you did not want to cook in the larger kitchen, which is in the the shared space. So I uh, have been designing this, working with uh, architects uh, here and overseas, and sort of have like now an initial concept of what this could look like. And then now started thinking about where could it be, uh, wanting it to be in an area that is amenitized to some extent, so that there is a grocery store, there is a library, uh, there is a coffee shop or a yoga studio. And then figuring out how to do that. If you do it in a major city, it becomes really expensive in terms of all the, you know, getting the land and building there. So lately, um, 
I've been looking at sort of some small towns that are near big cities and um, where there are amenities there and there are restaurants there and an outdoor market and there may be an hour away from the big city. So you can go out there, live, and then pop into the metropolitan area if there's some play or something that you want to see. So all of this is what I'm working out, and I've gotten funding support to really flesh out um, these ideas and to develop an investment package that would allow me then to talk uh, to developers. Because I'm very interested in what uh, older adults tell me, oh, we don't want to be an island of old people, we want to be in the mix. And so kind of thinking about, is there a... Um, uh, development where there are maybe on some of the floors, you know, it's multifamily housing. And then I have two or three floors where this concept is there and sort of figuring out um, what kind of amenities might even be in there. You know, I've, uh, people have talked to me about, could there be a clinic on one floor? Could there be you know, some sort of eatery? And then how do you bring the outdoors in? Should it only be available to people in the building? Or is there a way of integrating the community around it? So these are all the conversations that I'm having now with the base of there are drawings, there is a team, you know, we're continuing to talk, there is some funding to get me to this next level. So it's, it is, um, and I turned 70 last month. So uh, congratulations. Uh, and in fact, uh, the plus 50 entrepreneurs were one of the fastest growing segments. I think people don't know that, but we are. And you're also, um, in terms of a cohort, uh, the most successful um, in entrepreneurship. The other part of that, which yeah, people. Yeah. Yeah. I think after five years, if you're over 50 and have started a business, you're more likely to still be in business than, than those who are younger. Absolutely. 